So the panel uh, the, who will speak now in, in sort of responding to the questions we've raised. Um, first is Arun Ramanathan, who is the Executive Director of Education Trust West. Uh, second is Rick Simpson, who is the Deputy Chief of Staff to the California State Assembly Speaker, John Harris. The third will be Mero Vargo, who is the Executive Director of Pivot Learning Partners. And last but not least will be Angela Williams, who is the Assistant Executive Director of Policy and Programs at the California School Boards Association. I want to thank David, and, and I also want to uh, extend my appreciation for those presentations. Clearly, there's a lot of interesting information there. Um, and, you know, I, I think the point in time that we're at in California right now is an extraordinary point in time. In many ways, uh, I would liken it, you know, some people say that you, you work on an airplane while you're flying it. Uh, in this case, we're working on four different parts of the airplane flying it at the same time because we're changing our state accountability system, uh, we're changing our testing system, uh, we're changing our standards, curriculum, and instruction, and we're also changing our school finance system all at the same time. I think one of the things that's challenging, again, when you think about this process at a, a local level, um, and you also think about it from the perspective of, of our organization, because, you know, Ed Trust West, for those of you who don't know us, is that uh, our focus is on closing achievement gaps for low-income students and students of color is how all this is going to play out in an equitable way. How is this going to reach the majority, the benefits of these different changes, reach the majority of, of California students um, who are of color, who are poor, and, and transform their lives so that they can actually, and if you think about this, you know, from that 12-year lifespan of a student in our, in our education system, in the K-12 system, how it's actually going to get them to the college and career level. So I think that's, that's sort of one big issue that, that we have to talk about, is how these different parts of the system operate in alignment. And, and I would argue that we're actually not there yet. Um, that to some extent, what David presented at the front end is accurate. That we are still functioning in silos, and we're having conversations around accountability, student achievement, school finance, um, and a whole host of other issues, curriculum instruction and silos. And I think that it's, uh, it's incumbent upon all of us, including the folks here in this room, to try to figure out a way to unify those conversations. Because if we're having them in silos at the state level, we're definitely having them in silos at the local level. And I can tell you that that's certainly happening in terms of what we're looking at and seeing happen in school districts. In fact, I was sitting with a school board member yesterday uh, who was telling me that their LCFF planning is happening, uh, is being led by their chief financial officer, um, which you wouldn't necessarily want to be in charge of your local control funding formula planning, with as you saw all the parent engagement and all the other stuff up there that's a necessary part of the process working well. So I think we still have to make that translation at a state level. We also have to make that translation at the local level. And the second thing that I would argue at scale is, yeah, David, I don't know how much you actually talked about the findings of the, the USC PACE poll, but I, I sort of dwell in two worlds, right? There's, there's the world of education, which I think is an echo chamber. Right? You say things, and it bounces back, and you sort of hear what you say, and everybody's saying sort of the same things. And then there's a world of coffee shops and parent-teacher conferences. Um, of what happens you know, on, in classrooms, uh, professional development for teachers, uh, a, a world of, uh, of parents and teacher nights. And that's an entirely different world. And I think basically what the Pace USC study said is that there is no connection, really, at all, between the echo chamber that is education policy and education wonkery and even the sort of the base statements that the folks who were criticizing things in the education system hold as truths and facts, and what the general California public thinks about the state of education policy. Because the PACE and USC study essentially said that most people in the state of California are okay with the current system the way it is. They're okay with school accountability. They're okay with the testing system. And the messages that you generally hear in the echo chamber aren't reaching them. 
And I would also say, in addition to the issue of unification of these different parts of work, that we have a long way to go in reaching the general public about the changes that we're pushing. And that also, I think, is very evident inside the Pace USC study. Uh, I can tell you that if you walked into any audience of any school in the state of California and you asked, what does LCFF mean, you wouldn't get a whole lot of raised hands. But simultaneous, which is ex actually extraordinarily important if you want real parent and community engagement in the process. I think secondarily, though, which is, I think is more troubling, <laughs> if you asked, based on the pay study, how many people actually know what the common core is, seven out of 10 would say they have no idea. And that's actually true, because we went to our parent-teacher conference night two weeks ago, and nobody knew what the hell the common core was, right? So, and to some extent, the educators couldn't articulate it either, which is a problem. So clearly we have a lot of work to do here. And we also have a lot of work to do in creating that transition for the general public to understand what it means. And, and I'll give you another just example and I'll start turning it over to the other folks. Because, you know, last week um, our folks at Trust West folks went to a forum in Vacaville. Um, we didn't know this when we went there, but it was an anti-Common Core forum. <laughs> And we were the pro Common Core folks <laughs> there. Um, and it was an hour and a half, and there were 200 people in the room, 150, 200 people, and people were really mad about the Common Core, which made me make a really bad joke about what do Vacavillians throw when they get really angry, right? Yes. Oh, sorry, I couldn't help it. But, <laughs> you know, but, you know, that really is the baseline. Sorry, Carrie. Uh, that really is the baseline of what the challenge is ahead of us. Because right now what we've said is, is that we're backing out of providing any transparency or any data on student performance in the current year and potentially out into the out years. Student data that parents use for very specific purposes. How to pick their schools for their kids, how to you know, make, have conversations with teachers about the current performance of their kids, educators use for the purposes of RTI, and when they're thinking about special education, assessment evaluation, English learner reclassification, we're pulling all that information out because we in our education echo chamber think that the rest of the <coughs> non-echo chamber are going to be good with that. And then we're going to say to everyone, while not necessarily articulating it very well, this is your brilliant and wonderful future under the Common Core. I think that's a massive challenge for us, and I think that there are better ways than we are currently utilizing to make that transition. With that, I'll turn it over. Okay, okay Chris, you're next. Um, I'd, I'd also like to uh, uh, thank David and, and Pace and everybody for the, for the uh, opportunity to, uh, to join you and share a few thoughts. Um, just a couple, a couple of random things. One is, um, this is a process. It's not an event, it's a process. Um, I think we learned some important lessons uh, 12 or 14 years ago from our first attempt, as, as Deb was making reference to, at implementing uh, academic standards and, and accountability system around standards. Um, we were unfortunately, uh, back in the late 1990s, in sort of a ready, fire, aim, a mode, and we we tried to we, uh, adopted standards, and we tried to rush into um, creating an accountability system before the standards themselves have been embedded in day-to-day um, uh, -day classroom instruction, teacher training, and books and materials. And we were catching up for um, ha at least half a dozen years, and many places still are. And so we've we've actually tried to take that lesson. Um, uh, and keep it in mind as we're thinking through moving into Common Core standards, um, modifying our assessment system to reflect those standards, and what um, and what those you know test scores and all that sort of stuff means. Um, another th uh, thing that I try to keep in mind: um, an API or a testing system is not an accountability system. It's a measurement tool. It's a thermometer. Um, and we can, and I think we're moving in a positive direction in expanding the indicators that are part of our 
metric, our, 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 our thermometer, if you will. Um, for me, an accountability system is what then do you do with it? Um, how do you use that information to make decisions? And I think I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with Jonathan and his comments about NCLB. I think we um, are realizing um, uh, all across the state that the, the this NCLB federal mark, basically market-based kinds of mechanisms for changing organizations and changing systems um, doesn't work. It demoralizes the people in those systems. Um, and we're trying to move to a different, and think about accountability or improving systems and behavior and outcomes differently. When we're putting together LCFF and the accountability plans and the collaborative uh, and the, the evaluation rubrics, we're trying to think about this differently and, and, and quite self-consciously, perhaps even trying to change the conversation nationally. That rather than focus on sanctions and interventions and punishment when you do things wrong, try to create support systems. Um, the collaborative was tend to be a, a portion of that that I think aligns very uh, well with, with what Jonathan was talking about in the core districts. Trying to, the evaluation rubric, I actually made up this term, um, is, supposed, is explicitly um, holistic, multidimensional. Trying to not Try not to continue to summarize the achievement of a district or a, or a school in a single number that's the, you know, like an index of leading indicators like economists try to do, but try to, try to um, explicitly acknowledge the variety of kinds of outcomes and situations in schools that we value. And some of it's relatively easy to measure and some of it probably isn't. Some of it may be narrative. Some of it may be binary. Some of it, you know, may, may be kind of kind of fuzzy doesn't mean it's not important. And, and try to take a different view about how we think about school performance and school accountability. The, um, the, the uh, collaborative, as, as Sue mentioned, is an attempt to provide some resources that where districts locally, their colleague districts or the county superintendents may not have the particular expertise they need to try to go out and find it wherever it is, at the universities, at West Ed, at, at, at um, Pivot, at, at um, you know, other um, uh, practitioners around the state, trying to find that expertise. Um, we have 10 million bucks to, to, to buy it, to, to, to access it, and dispatch it to where it's needed. I mean, we're actually hoping that this collaborative and its resources will be something for which demand exceeds supply. That this is not intended to be something districts fear and, and are nervous about. It's something that we hope they would you know, structure it in a way that, that, they, would, that they would welcome. Um, the, the last uh, uh, comment I'll make is, uh, I'll take a slight bit of issue with, with, with one thing Sue said in there about um, how to spend all the new money. There isn't any new money in LCFF or the, or the budget forecast. There's no new money at all. All that's there is what Proposition 98 will otherwise generate um, as a result of Prop 30, no doubt. Prop 30 stopped the bleeding, but there's no new money. And, and we have to do keep in mind that um, we haven't fixed school finance in California. We have dealt to a large degree with some of the equity issues. Um, we have dealt to a large degree with the um, sort of state versus local decisions over how to spend money, much more so than the last two, three decades. We haven't dealt with the adequacy issue. Um, and, and that is still an important um, uh, uh, policy and fiscal issue for this state to address. We are profoundly underinvested in public schools in this state. Even though we move money around the state, we are still profoundly underinvested. And we have to acknowledge that and figure out going forward how to deal with that issue as well. Here, here. Uh, I happen to agree with several of my colleagues that this is an extraordinary moment in the state and in, in the evolution of state policy. Uh, and I am also very grateful that we've given ourselves two years hiatus in um, accountability in the sense of reporting out about successes and failures for us to take advantage of this extraordinary opportunity which 
involves uh, the simultaneous, we're talking, we, someone talked about it the other day as two bolts of lightning hitting public education in California at once, LCFF and the Common Core, and I guess we've got a third now with the next generation science standards. For us to figure out what accountability should and could look like, and I want to emphasize the, the opportunity here in this kind of environment, should take us a couple of years with a bunch of, a, a bunch of people thinking hard, more or less full, full time, and taking advantage of naturally occurring experiments like the core waiver to test out approaches that might work. Accountability is complex for reasonable and legitimate reasons. The first thing we need to keep in mind is we are not going to, nor should we try to, improve away the complexity of accountability. I think that that was probably one of the mistakes of NCLB. Why don't we just make this simple and then it'll work better? Well, um, uh, they did, but it didn't. Um, accountability is complicated because public schools are legitimately accountable in multiple dimensions mentions to multiple things, you know, to communities, to um, provide safe environments for their kids, to state agencies for, for, um, for wise use of resources, and we could go on and on. Nothing we do in accountability will improve away the complexity of the system. So we're going to have to get comfortable with complexity here. But the other reason that, that accountability confuses us is, is a classic blind man and the elephant problem, um, where everybody's got hold of a, of a piece of the accountability elephant and says, well, the real issue in accountability is what's the test going to look like, or what's what should the goals be, or what should the met right metric be for social emotional, or what should the intervention be when somebody really doesn't doesn't hit the goals? All of those matter, um, and all of those have to be uh, be be part of an accountability system. But for me, it's really relatively simple in that what we're doing here is we're slicing and dicing about four admittedly complex, but only about four sets of things. One is, there's data. There's data about, uh, um, about test scores and what kids are doing. There's data about um, uh, resources and what money is going into the system. And right there, you're going to say, wait a minute, you're, you're mixing inputs and outputs. Absolutely, it's all data that's part of the system. That's one building block is data. Then we've got goals. Somebody's got to, sit, got to decide what the goals are. Then there's reports that come out of that. The reports aren't the accountability exactly, but they kind of are because they call them public schools for a reason. The reports are the public part of accountability, and we need to pay particular uh, uh, attention to that because one of the, I agree with Rick, that we're dramatically short of resources and underfunded, but arguably the resource that, that is scarcest in public education education right now is trust. I know everybody everybody likes their local teacher, but if you get into the conversation between schools and communities, between district offices and people who work at the school site, between state agencies and people who work at the at, at, at the local level, distrust is 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 common and is um, is arguably one thing that we've produced with the wrong kind of accountability system and under under NCLB and admitting again that NCLB was not was not all bad but it did produce as most policy does some unintended consequences so reporting and transparency is a key part of accountability um, but the last one that's part of accountability as well is decision making. So if we think of accountability as a system that's created um, by combining reports, of re reports which report on data relative to goals and lead to decision making, there's a kind of a system there that we can think of big picture. And then the particular reports, it's the, if it's the Title III report that we could, um, uh, um, uh, and bless Sue for giving it a go, um, roll into the LCAP, that's great. But we still are going to have, have data relative to goals that gets rolled up into some reports that results into dis in decision making. The next question is, who, who does what? Um, interestingly, in the core districts, 
they're, they're saying some version of most of it they're going to do at the local level. Well, that's, that's what, one way to do it. But the state also has a legitimate interest in accountability. And the one thing that I think we would mostly agree on, mostly, but this is a new, uh, that we, we're in a new, new realm here, is that, um, is that the state has a legitimate interest in standardizing the metrics and maybe standardizing some goals, though right now the state priorities are not exactly goals, they're sort of areas in which locals would set goals, you could also do it that way. Um, but the issue for me that is on the table right now in a very, very interesting way is this issue of standardization and customization. That is, in a state of a thousand school districts, what are you going to decide at the state level and what are you going to decide at the local level? It, feel, it feels to me that that's the, the crux of the matter that we're really debating about, about right now. Um, the state has a, standardization is a good thing. And that's a, but not always. And that's the hard part about this. Um, uh, I talk about this as, as sockets and light bulbs. When Edison invented the light bulb, he also invented the socket. But he must pretty quickly have figured out that if you standardize the socket, you could do more creative and interesting work at the level of the light bulb. And somebody in his workshop probably said, but wait a minute, boss, I've got an idea for a better socket. Didn't matter. The action wasn't at the socket level. If you standardize the socket, you could get more creative at the level of, of, of the light bulb, and you can see what resulted in any hardware store. So, so the state of California has to figure out and has is in the process of figuring out what you standardize in order to customize the things that where customization matters. Um, a bunch of different kinds of light bulb sockets didn't matter. And back in the bad old days, which I at least am old enough, and some others in the audience probably also, when we, when we didn't standardize assessments um, and every, every school was excellent and had the assessment data to prove it, that was, that, was not, that was not innovation or customization that helped. In fact, that was a problem. So now we're, going, we're pretty agreed. We're going to standardize assessments. We're going to standardize, I hope, and I, I believe some other data elements, for example, the definition of, um, of more of the uh, account, accounting core codes, the SACS codes, that sort of thing. thing. That's standard. That's th there's no, no reason to, to get really innovative at the local level about some of that thing, that, that stuff. But I think where, where, where local innovation and customization and the flexibility matters is at the level of decision making about what's going to happen as a result of particular kinds of data and particular progress. Because we all know that the decisions that matter most for kids are largely those that are made by teachers in classrooms and somewhat those that are, that, that are made um, by, by groups of teachers meeting in grade level teams and principals meeting with their faculties and sometimes at, by district level decision makers and once in a rare day at the state level but the really nitty gritty of education happens in that intimate connection between kids and teachers. So I think if we think of, about accountability in terms of standardizing some data elements in order to allow customization and flexibility about decision making. We've got a kind of big idea that can guide <coughs> us here because we have in the past rarely thought about accountability data as informing local decision making first and state and federal decision making sec sec second. As several of my colleagues have, have mentioned, we've always, or under the uh, NCLB pattern, accountability was about deciding what label and what intervention, not what local action was going to happen by what teacher to adjust what curriculum, et cetera. I also think that the final final kind of local flexibility that needs to now get get built into this local decision making is local control funding formula. 
um, the, that, that at the local level, if people are really going to make locally decisions about resource allocation, you, we've got to start to be really clear about giving people at the local level data that's actionable about the results of investments that they decided to make. And return on investment is not a concept that's very comfortable to us in public education. But my gosh, guys, if, um, over the past five years, we asked school board members to cut either um, well, ultimately, they had to cut both, so that then, meant, then maybe it was easy. But in the, the first round of cuts, they had to cut either summer school or the Saturday school or the after-school program, and yet no school board member in the state could say which of those is the most cost-effective program, and let's keep that one. Um, be, without that kind of data, which, which the state could help local decision makers to have and use, without that kind of data, you're not, you're, you're not going to get um, uh, actual database decisions. So I think we've got a lot of raw materials here, and I think we've got the opportunity to do something extraordinarily new and different, but I think it's going to take us hard work over the next couple of years um, and a lot of different perspectives at the table. Thanks for letting me share mine. So, uh, yeah, so obviously, thank you, David, uh, for the invitation and, of course, for the presentations from Deb and Sue and Jonathan. And, of course, to the governor and uh, the legislature uh, and the state board and all those just involved in really talking about and finally getting to a point, at least from a school board perspective, where this idea of uh, local control is much more than, you know, rhetoric and uh, not, uh, I think, in many board members' A point of view, not necessarily done yet, but absolutely 75, 85 percent along the way. Uh, we've been um, out uh, in the state of California, like many organizations, talking to our board members, really looking at this uh, local control funding formula conversation as a way to build the human capital development of school board members. Um, so many of them, of course, are uh, local citizens, and their uh, passion around education needs to be met with quality information. And we are actually really uh, seeing some extremely positive uh, feelings, obviously, from school board members who have wanted to do this for some time, but also for ones that have just come on board. And we also have seen a lot of um, uh, collective impact. What I mean by that is that lots of organizations are now coming to the table, traditional uh, well, uh, non-traditional alliances are springing up. We had a great meeting uh, probably a month or so back with a lot of uh, public interest and civil rights groups to really have the discussion about, so where are we at as far as values? And in so many places, school board members and those folks um, that just so happen to have uh, communities of color and communities of interest at heart, they're in the same place. In many cases, they're the same people. And so that is heartening because I think a lot of the context, um, a lot of the, um, the conditions for success have been set. There's a lot, there's lots of tension. Um, you know, this is not a um, completely optimistic endeavor, but at least I think the goodwill starts off really well. I will take umbrage to Arun's comment around, uh, and not deep umbrage, it's just rhetorical umbrage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fight it out later. <laughs> no, 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 not a chance. Um, uh, around CBOs, right? So now I understand the comment, yes, uh, you know, you're, you might not want to put your LCFF and LCAP plan in the hands of your CBO. You might want to make sure that your CBO looks at the budget from an investment point of view, right? From the assets of the students in the community as opposed to just bottom line. So CBOs are good people do. I mean, just ask Jeff, they're very good people. But at the end of the day, you really want um, to change the paradigm. And I think that's the key thing. So what we've been talking to our board members about is changing the paradigm from simply budget allocation, uh, means and ends accountability, and focusing on investments. How do you create the environment in your district, right? How do you set those conditions for student success? You know, a lot of what um, is inspiring about uh, Jonathan's uh, presentation is that idea of a theory of change and a theory of action board members getting together and figuring out, so what do we expect? And who can help us get that information that we need? And how can we reach out to communities and really get them involved beyond the usual suspects? 
Well, you know, one of the one of the the real and important outcomes of the meeting with the civil rights and public interest groups was board members asking questions. How do I get beyond the five, uh, you know, community members that come to every single meeting? And so, really digging deeply into this idea of uh, community engagement is extremely important, um, and it's also a way to create a stakeholder. Um, uh, buy-in and reality that you're going to need more than just the funding, uh, right, the, the increased funding um, to actually get to these outcomes, right? What is uniquely spurious is the idea that, okay, we've got more money plus a great program that, you know, best practices, scalable, all of that, and all of a sudden we get to the end and we have a great program and folks are not dropping out and the numbers are great on graduation and we don't have chronic absenteeism. That, that's, that's, that's not how it's going to happen. It's going to happen over time, creating the conditions where more folks, community members, um, all kinds of institutions are involved. So uh, we've been uh, having great conversations about this, this uh, very uh, important reflex that's happening in many districts, uh, and, or at least with many conversations, informal conversations with school boards around just adding funding back. Uh, we lost this previously, now we need to get it back. And what we've been saying to them again is the investment paradigm. It's not just about adding back, it's really about getting to the end result with investments in mind. So even when it comes to this conversation around teachers, uh, the, the, the leverage that we think that board members have is having the conversation with unions and others around the idea of closing the achievement gap. Everyone knows all of the research that says that, you know, among the top five, maybe the first of five, if, according to which study you look at, um, uh, quality teachers, right? Uh, a key component to closing the achievement gap. But not only that, is are your teachers BCLAD certified? I mean, looking at really your personnel, because at the end of the day, it's going to be people that are working in schools and districts that are actually going to, uh, you know, be that factor at the end of the day that's consistent with students and raising their achievement. Um, above all, we've been saying to to our school board members, this governance first. It is a remarkable moment. Uh, around a uh, deeper understanding and a deeper engagement in governance. And so, you know, our job is really to make sure that uh, we can uh, supply our members with the best possible knowledge, not only of really how to set the agenda and have strong oversight, but also to set those goals, right, those transformational goals and outcomes. Um, and since the environment has been set and the expectation is um, that this can't happen, I think you're seeing lots of board members rise to the occasion. So. Um, I know we're talking about the broader question of uh, accountability, but uh, I think, at least for, for our money, uh, this, this moment around LCFF and governance is one that's key to our organization, and I think key to the success, not only of accountability, but also to the successful implementation of LCFF and LCAP, and also, again, the big vision for everyone in the room and around the state is to literally raise the achievement of all students, and particularly those students called out in the funding formula. One of the things we strive to do at PACE is to put together a program that answers all of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> There's really no need for questions, I know, but if anybody happens to have a question, um, I think we, we can take a couple now, and then we'll talk about the PACE poll uh, in five minutes or so. But is, is there, are there any questions, or did we answer them all? Yeah, Derek? Thank you all for your, for your comments. Uh, I'm particularly struck by Angelo's statement about the reflex that the school board members have to continue allocating the way they have before to try to plug the hole that's been created over the last few decades. Um, and I think in addition to that, there's an enormous amount of momentum, inertia, just because this is the way we've operated for a long time. And, and I think it's gonna take a large and intentional effort to, to move away from that. Uh, the board members are actually gonna have to think really hard about this and, and break existing habits. So I'm just wondering if anybody has any ideas how that's going to happen. I know there are a lot of very enlightened boards out there who are doing a great job. Um, I don't know if they're in the majority or the minority, but I, I'm pretty sure there are a lot that are not going to be able to do this by themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that, and again, uh, I think all of us on uh, the panel will have some, something to say about that and something to say about their work with school boards. But I think, you know, one of the ways that we're attempting to work with school boards is to literally go out and talk to them, right? Not only give them, you know, 
uh, key advice and also uh, best practices from other districts, but also to enjoin other boards, right, to quite literally work with boards. I mean, it's almost like a PLC for board members, is to really get them to, to, to first and foremost, again, see the entire thing through different eyes, right? Investments as opposed to just budgets, assets as opposed to just needs. Um, it goes into the way that you look at the student and the community as well. And that's another courageous conversation that has to happen, that must happen. But I think what you find is that uh, school board members on the whole have that goodwill. Many of them ran for, and I'll, I'll say this, uh, I guess, positive kind of um, outing some, some, some sensibilities around board members, but I think it's safe to do it here. Uh, so many run on uh, you know, a particular issue, right? And they find themselves uh, completing that issue and really looking around and saying, okay, well, what else is there to do? But I think that the key thing is, is connecting their issue with the broader picture and recognizing that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to get it right. And I think that from our uh, vantage point in visiting boards and talking to them at our annual conference with connecting with them through the many different ways that we connect with board members, there's a lot uh, you know, of folks who are really ready to do that. They're ready to learn how to do things differently and many of them are. So we're really trying to go peer to peer and direct contact to help them to get to where they need to be. And if, if I could just add on that, because I really greatly appreciate the work that uh, California School Board Association is doing there. Um, but, you know, we're also going to still have to have a state role, yeah. right? There's still a role for the state true. in protecting the rights of the powerless. Um, you know, the old language around local control, there was a reason that the state and the federal government stepped in, because that was the language used to protect segregation. And what we can't have occur, I think, with this wonderful change in terms of local control funding formula, is essentially the money getting used for the same old purposes. If the money's supposed to be there for the benefit of low-income students, English learners, and foster youth, a good chunk of it, we still need from the state some strong assurances that that is gonna result in benefit for those students. Because quite frankly, a lot of the outcomes-based accountability has been stripped. So we won't know how they're doing academically based on the legislation over the next few years. We still need the state to provide transparency, particularly input transparency, on where the dollars are going. If you want to make a case for return on investment, or if you want to make a case a few years from now, or maybe soon, that we need to invest more money in our public schools, then this better work well. And the promise needs to be kept for our kids and community. So there are some high stakes issues here that are extremely important in terms of assurances, transparency, and actual accountability, because that's actually hard to see a little bit in the way the legislation's going. And I think that's on us at the local level, but it's also still on the state. Just a, just a brief rejoinder. I know that other folks have something to say, but just wanted to make something clear. The key factor, right, particularly in thinking about the mission the state has set uh, school board members off on, and also that the state has set itself on, Right, uh, number one is a Herculean task, right? We already know that it's not enough money. Even at the level, right, of multiple um, uh, targets to 2021, and we're constantly telling board members, you're not gonna get all that money next year. This money is also <coughs> allocated over time. And don't forget, right, that you have to worry about the economy, you have to worry about Prop 30, you have to worry about all of that. So it's not just the idea that the state is gonna come in and provide you know, additional dollars and then everything's gonna be okay. It's changing the way that board members and schools and school districts and partners and NGOs work together. And it is important that an adversarial relationship in any particular case, particularly when it comes to the rights of minorities, is absolutely important uh, to bring up those issues, to resolve them, to have the state step in where there are, uh, where, there's, where there's problems. And we do have problems around resegregation in the state of California. But what's important is the paradigm, literally, of collective impact. If we can't see ourselves all on one side of this and work with that in mind, then we're not going to get to the end result that we think. There continues to be need, more support for board members in actually looking at this idea of local control and local accountability. It's one thing to say, here, here's your right, right? It's another thing to say, here's supports for your rights turning, uh, uh, related to uh, local control. So I mean, we look forward to working with all groups who are working for 
the same ends. And if we can recognize that at the leadership level, at the statewide level, that we need to model that kind of behavior and bring in the state where necessary, then I think we can get that same kind of collective uh, impact and, and also you know, core responsibility of organizations with one another at the local level as well. I was going to go to Rick next, just since he's the representative of the state here. <laughs> okay. Give him a chance to. We've been talking well, about um, uh, I remember from uh, physics, Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton was right that inertia is a powerful force of nature. Um, and, and, and you're right that, that uh, trying to change people's attitudes and how they view budgets and how they make decisions is tough. Um, and writing a law like, the, like uh, AB 97, LCFF, it is admittedly a blunt instrument. Um, but I hope you listen to Sue carefully because she did mention it, that, that we, for the first time, time, tried to connect the budget adoption and their local accountability plan. The goals and the specific actions to implement those goals is explicitly in the law and, and is how you're supposed to, to um, uh, tie your spending to, to the state priorities and other local priorities that, that you adopt. Admittedly, um, this is something that is different than many, if not most districts, are have, uh, historically think, thought about their budgets and, and you know, uh, pet projects and things. Um, hard to get people off of. Uh, it will take um, some professional development and training by the county superintendents, who are the first line of oversight of, of, of school district budgets, and it, it will take some time. But I think, hopefully, you've at least seen a recognition um, in terms of how we wrote the law that that is a connection we do need to make, that we need to think about um, in investment uh, toward specific goals, toward specific outcomes, toward the, the kinds of things we, we think we value in, in terms of edu educational outputs. I agree with Rick that the connection between uh, connecting budgets with plans uh, is the revolution here, and that, that um, Angelo also said the key words about how you break loose that tendency to rebuild what you've dismantled over the last five years. And that is community engagement, that if you ask your community, and it's great that the law requires a minimal level of community engagement, but we work with districts all over the state, and what we're telling districts is look, start now engage your community very broadly in talking about goals and priorities and, and, high, and setting priorities among activities relative to the goals in the state areas, um, in the eight state areas, and use those to drive budget development over the next three years. And that if you think about it that way, you will not you, you will recreate some of the things that you dismantled, but it'll be because there's an actual constituency in the community for those, those particular activities and priorities. That the accountability we're trying to rebuild here is the accountability between schools and communities. And we're gonna have to be a little bit patient. Mistakes will be made. But this has this this approach has extraordinarily extraordinary potential to have an impact and recreate what accountability means um, if we actually engage are brave enough at the local level to engage communities in not in arguing over how shall we spend five thousand eight hundred and twenty two dollars in our school improvement budget which is the way we used to do it but instead engage communities in setting goals and establishing priorities and using those to divide, to drive the technical decisions that have to be made to create in district budgets I want to thank the panel um, both, both for their initial comments and, and for that discussion, because I think that, that gets to the heart of the matter here. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, Jeff Harrelson and Ben Telsher to come up and we'll talk a little bit about the case poll as well.